Spider Basics Beyond the Eight Legs. Hello YouTube, and welcome to episode 3 of Spider Basics Beyond the Eight Legs. And in this episode, I'm covering something that just about everyone has wondered at some point. How do spiders make these webs? I'm doing this video now because the next video I'll be putting out is a deep dive on Araneus diadematus, the cross orb weaver. And all of this will apply to that spider, but it applies to a lot of species. Most orb weavers, in fact. So it seemed right to give it its own video in the Spider Basics series. Humanity has been fascinated by these webs for millennia, and with good reason. Most of us have seen these orb webs constructed in what seem to be impossible places. Now spiders can't fly, and orb weavers don't jump, so how in the name of all things good and right did this spider make a web between this fence and this barbecue? Or between this frame and this light stand over here? Or between the ceiling and my ping pong table? Some orb weavers have built webs that actually crossed rivers. How? To answer that, let's start as the spiders do, with how they begin these webs. Now that's not an easy question to answer. In his 1996 paper exploring this, Samuel Shaka writes in his introduction, You need much more than a little bit of luck to watch construction from the very start, since the time of onset of the construction is unpredictable, and even those who were lucky enough to be present when the first threads were laid had problems in actually describing it when they saw it for the first time. A couple of paragraphs later, Shaka writes, The present paper aims to remedy this situation by depicting the web construction process in, hopefully, an understandable but yet essentially correct way. It actually seems that the very beginning of web construction is the least consistent part of the process, and there's more than one way for the spiders to do it. But it does begin by bridging the gap. The first thing a spider needs for a web is a place to put it. This requires an open space with something on either side to attach it to. And one way or another, they need to establish a thread between two points. In Shaka's 1996 study, he was using juvenile cross orb weavers and rather small frames, and in this scenario, the spiders attached a thread here, crawled across to here, tightened up the line, and attached it. From there, they built the proto-hub, a structure where several threads attached to the supporting structure joined together at a single point. There were three different ways they could make a thread from the hub to the supporting structure. One was to simply walk along an existing thread. A second was to just drop down on a drag line, letting gravity do the work. The third, well, as Shaka delightfully explains, it uses what I am tempted to call the Tarzan method. The spider, after having attached the thread, walks a few centimeters and then drops down, swinging around the place where the drag line is attached. When the spider, in full swing, hits another thread or part of the supporting structure, it grabs it and continues the construction from there. Whichever way they got there, the spiders would then anchor a new line, cut through the first one, and crawl back to the hub on it, gathering it up as they went and letting out a more permanent one behind them, anchoring that to the hub once they got there. Now once they had a few of these in place, they'd construct a definite top frame, then move the proto-hub into its final position, making it now the hub. Only then did they make the first final radius thread between the hub and the top frame. And after that, they started inserting more frame threads and radii. Now, I just used some terms like radii and frame thread. What are those? If we look at a web, we can identify, generally, a few different components. Now, forgetting about the spiral for a second, a web generally looks like this. These threads here, that attach directly to the supporting structure, are anchor threads. These threads around here are frame threads, and these are the radii, and you'll notice that none of the radii are ever attached directly to the supporting structure, only to the frame. And that's what the juvenile spiders did for Shaka on small frames in the lab in 1996. 
Outdoors, webs have a different beginning, and H. M. Peters described the process in detail in 1939. But since his work on the topic is 92 pages long and entirely in German, and since my German is nicht so gut, I had to rely on Rainer Felix's summary of it in his book Biology of Spiders. Now, rather than walk across a detour with a drag line like Shaka's spiderlings did in the lab, outdoors these spiders usually let out a thread into the air to be carried by wind until it gets caught on something. And voila, just like that, the spider has bridged the gap. Now, Shaka saw his young spiders try to do this in the lab, but it almost never worked. And when it did, Shaka writes, It was to my misfortune because it allowed the spider to leave the field of vision on the camera, often enough to build a web just next to it, leaving me with a blank recording of the moves. There must be just enough moving air in my office for this to happen, because I was trying to get this orb weaver to build a web in this frame, and instead she somehow got a line all the way across to this light stand and built a web right here. I have no idea what could possibly be creating all the air currents down here. I mean, it's not like there's anyone here who goes into way too much detail about things they're interested in and has no idea how to be quick and to the point about anything they want to share with anyone who will listen. <sighs> I couldn't move that light stand for six weeks. Anyway, once they've got this one bridge, they crawl across it, attach a new line firmly, then cut the first line, come halfway back, making a new section behind them, rejoin it in the middle, then drop down on a drag line until they hit something. So again, they've made a line that they can crawl across, but then cut and gather up later. So it seems those initial threads just provide a pathway to crawl along while they create the actual structural thread, which might be a different kind of silk. Now the spider has this Y structure, which forms the basic framework. Their process after this is bafflingly elaborate. They simultaneously create new frame threads and new radii, first by sort of duplicating an existing radius, then attaching a new line somewhere along it, and carrying that new line all the way over to the supporting structure on one of the other radii. Then it comes back to this point along the new frame, bites through the temporary radius it just created, and replaces it with a new one, returning to the hub. Now I think this allows the spider to make the radius to exactly the tension it wants, and the tensions can affect how vibrations transmit through the web, which is how the spider senses a lot of its world. Once the frame is complete, the spider adds in a few more radial threads to create a sort of basic scaffolding. After that, the additional radial threads follow two rules. The direction always alternates, and a new radius is always made under an existing one. So the order might look something like this. This might remind you a bit of the way you're supposed to tighten lug nuts when changing a tire. If you didn't know this, this is how you're supposed to tighten lug nuts on a tire. And it's probably for more or less the same reason, to even out the tensions and stresses in the web. What's more, after completing each new radial thread, the spider returns to the hub and tugs on all the existing radii with its front legs, as if to measure the angles between them, and then decides where to put the next one. And usually, with 20 to 30 radial threads in the web, the angles between them all are surprisingly consistent, usually about 15 degrees. So that's how these webs begin. Now what about the spiral part? Well, while making all of the radial threads, the spider probably puts a few turns of a spiral into the hub to strengthen the whole thing. And once the radii are done, it makes what's called the auxiliary spiral. Now this is a really wide spiral that goes from the center not quite to the outside, and this stabilizes the half-finished web and gives the spider a sort of scaffolding to work from, as well as a guide for the final capture spiral. Once this spiral is done, the spider pauses for a moment before embarking on the final step, the capture spiral. Up until this point, the silk the spider has been using has been non-sticky. Now, the spider uses different silk glands and spigots to create silk coated in little droplets of glue, beginning at the outer perimeter of the web. As they go from radial to radial, they reach out with one front leg and pluck the next radial, gauging its position. Then a rear leg pulls silk from the spinnerets and attaches it to the radial, now we have to slow it down to really see what's happening, but when we do, it becomes very clear that this is a very calculated, methodical process, and the result 
is a very consistently spaced mesh. Interestingly though, the web is not symmetrical across a horizontal axis. The hub is usually above center. So how does the spacing remain roughly equal when the web is a spiral? Well, it's not completely a spiral. The spider knows the hub is off center and in the bottom half of the web actually changes direction frequently so that the bottom half will have more strands than the top. And if we look closely, we can see where the spider turned around and changed direction. But the spider keeps doing this until they're near but not at the center. Now right in the center is the hub and strengthening zone, which has a non-sticky spiral to it. But between that and the capture spiral is the free zone, where there's no spiral at all. This space allows the spider to quickly move from one side of the web to the other one necessary by just sort of ducking through the empty space between the radials. Now often, these webs are nearly but not quite straight up and down, and when they do have just a bit of an angle to them, the spider usually sits in the hub on the underside, not the top side. Now this is so that if it's disturbed or threatened, it can just drop to the ground immediately on a drag line, making a quick escape without having to crawl through to the other side. When all is said and done, there are 1000 to 1500 connection points in the orb web, where silk strands cross each other, and it only takes 0.2 seconds for the spider to firmly glue them together, which is faster than any instant glue humanity has been able to devise. And unbelievably, the spider can build this entire web start to finish in under an hour. What's more, the entire thing weighs less than one one thousandth the weight of the spider. That's like me building a web the size of my house that I could hang out in all day, made out of material that in total weighed less than this TV remote. Now, are there things that can influence the shape of this web? Yes, there are. For instance, the spider has to make a decision about how widely to space the turns of the capture spiral, and it turns out that's not random. In 1998, Judith Schneider and Fritz Volrath wanted to know if that might be influenced by what kind of prey happened to be active around the spiders. So they abducted 15 young cross orb weavers from a field station in Denmark and fed them one fruit fly a day for six days. Each day, they took detailed measurements of the mesh spacing, then severed most of the radii, collapsing the web in on itself, effectively destroying the capture spiral, but leaving the silk there so the spiders could eat it and recycle the proteins. Shortly after that, they put the new prey in. This forced the spiders to spin a new web every day, and also ensured that the spiders had no webs when the prey was introduced. After six days, they switched to feeding them mosquitoes, which had longer legs and wingspans, but weren't much different in terms of body mass, and thus didn't really give a higher energy return to the spider. And sure enough, the spiders made different webs. The length of the capture spiral was the same, but the mesh size was larger. This allowed the spiders to increase the total capture area of the web without hurting its effectiveness the larger mosquitoes would still be caught in the larger mesh. When they switched back to fruit flies, the spiders switched back to a tighter mesh. So the web weaving behavior isn't just a pre-programmed routine. The spiders actually respond and make decisions based on the circumstances. This is called behavioral plasticity, and this study demonstrated that these animals have more of it than we'd previously thought. Can anything else affect how these webs are built? Yes, drugs. Drugs can affect how they're built. Some of you may remember the Spiders on Drugs video that went around years ago and is not entirely appropriate for younger audiences. Believe it or not, it had its basis in truth. This began in 1948 when German zoologist H.M. Peters, the same guy who wrote the detailed account of web building, decided that he was tired of his garden spiders building their webs at the ungodly hour of 2 to 5 a.m., so he asked his good buddy P.N. Witt, a pharmacologist, for a stimulant to try to get the spiders to spin their webs earlier. This was a failure. The spiders wove their webs at the same time, they just did it more wrongerly. As Rainer Felix puts it, In the following years, Witt tested a great variety of drugs, caffeine, mescaline, and strychnine, 
on orb web spiders and investigated how those substances affected web construction. Now, most of the time, the drugs made the webs messier and more irregular, especially caffeine. LSD-25, however, in very low doses, apparently made the spiders hyper-focused, and there was a slight increase in the regularity of the web geometry. I really liked how in telling this story, Rainer Felix actually tells us the procedure for giving drugs to spiders. I'm not going to say it on YouTube, though, because I'm pretty sure a lot of you would try it, and we don't need half the spiders in the English-speaking world to spend the whole summer stoned. We need them doing their jobs. And that, broadly speaking, is how orb-weaving spiders go about making their webs. Now, there are variations on this. Some orb-weavers make their webs horizontally, so the process might be a bit different, and usually horizontal webs are more symmetrical. Some orb-weavers add little features in, like a stabilimentum, a feature made of silk that decorates the web. And the scientists are still not sure, by the way, what the purpose of those is. But the webs that we're all familiar with the ones we've all walked face first into on a warm summer day, are made pretty much in this way. Now, coming up soon will be a deep dive video on one of these spiders, Araneus diadematus, the cross orb weaver, also known as the European garden spider. The link will be here when it's done. Am I pointing in the right place this time? And a lot of the research that taught us everything I just told you was done on that species, so it all applies. I hope to see you there once I get that one up. Subscribe and click the little bell so that you're notified when I post it. I hope this answers the question for you of how these spiders do this. If this ever kept you up at night, then perhaps you'll sleep better now. If you enjoyed this video or found it helpful, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and a big thank you to my Patreon supporters. If you want additional content, behind the scenes footage, random spider encounters, and more, check out my Patreon page. It's the very best way to support this channel and really helps out as I try to continue making these videos. I deeply appreciate everyone who supports me there. Also, you can check out my Shopify store for some channel merch that also supports the channel. Until then, thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you next time on Spider Basics Beyond the Eight Legs. Cheers!